Hey, what's going on folks? It's Mike here and welcome to the next lesson in our deep programming language series. In this lesson, we're going to continue talking about functions, talking about function overloading in the deep programming language. Now, this is a really useful feature because what it allows us to do is use the same name for a function, but choose the function based off of the argument types. So this is something that languages like C, for example, famously don't support. But it's a way to allow us to have a consistent API of named functions, meaning I could have an add function that could add integers, floating point, double, real values, or whatever, without having to rename the function. The compiler is able to call the best match function. Now, this is where we have to be a little bit careful on what I want to talk about, though, in the remainder of this lesson, just how function overloading works with some examples. So with that said, let's go ahead and dive in here. And from the D programming page, we can go ahead to the documentation, language reference, down to functions, and we can find in the specification the function overloading here, which is bullet point 14, and get the basic idea here. Now, th this particular uh, documentation will give you sort of all the rules for which function to call. But I'll go ahead and just show you what the rules are, how this works, or exactly how the feature works, again, if we have an ambiguous uh, case. So let's just go ahead and again run with this example where I want to add, for instance, an integer a and b here. And I'll go ahead and just print out for the sake of this the function signature, taking in two integers and returning an integer, sometimes written uh, with an arrow here, and return the result of a plus b here. And let's go ahead and duplicate this function here. And I'll go ahead and just paste it down here and have a separate version for, let's go ahead and handle adding of bools, for instance. And let's go ahead and update our signature here. And our return type here, which is just going to be bool, uh, for instance. OK, now this is a little bit of a weird example, because why would we add bools? Or is it possible that we run into a situation where a bool, which might be represented by 1 plus 1, gives us a different integer here? So again, that's the reason we might need these different overloads to handle the different capacities or rules of the data type. In fact, I'm just going to go ahead and amend this and return an integer because, again, if we run into the situation where I add 1 plus 1, we need something big enough to represent this value. OK, anyway, with that example, let's go ahead and just run this here and go ahead and do an add here. And I'll go ahead and create some integers. Uh, A, let's set that to 5. B equal to 6 here. And a Boolean uh, x equal to 0 and a boolean equal to uh, y equals 1, and make our appropriate function calls a and b. And again, observe the same name function here, add with x and y. And just so we can see the result of this, let's go ahead and write a line here. So we can see the output. And we should effectively see the result and which function was called. OK, so I'll use rdmd here just to quickly run this script here. And we can see that the appropriate call is made here for our first call selecting from integers versus the second call here. Now, again, what happens if I only had one version of this function? Meaning that the compiler wasn't able to say, hey, I have a bool here for both of these types, so I must be talking about this particular version here. Well, let's go ahead and see here. And what I'll do is just erase this function here. Let's go ahead and just remove it. And if I run this, well, it still actually works. It's able to implicitly treat bool as an integer. But any time in our code when we're having this type and saying, well, actually treat this as an integer, we have to be a little bit careful. Famously, in many programming languages, this can be a little bit tricky to actually catch uh, when these errors arise here. So that's why we usually want overloads with the specific types as inputs here. So let's go ahead and try the opposite case here. And I'll go ahead and comment out our integer version. And I'll run this again. And in this case, well, there isn't some implicit conversion that can happen because, in fact, it doesn't like that I'm passing in this value a into here. And just to be a little bit more clear about that, let me go ahead and just rename these here to names that we haven't used, c and d, for instance, c and d. And let's go ahead and run this. 
Again, just so that you can see this argument C here of type int, it doesn't like doing that conversion here because we're losing some information. So again, the decompiler is pretty good about this in general, telling us when there's some casting going in the sort of wrong direction. That is taking some value that could be very large and trying to cast it. Now, again, we could sort of try these experiments and say, well, what if this is uh, zero and one or one and one or something small enough? Again, it's still using the actual type here to try to figure out if this is a problem or not. So that's a general idea. Again, the D language letting us name functions the same thing so we can call it the right version of the function. So again, let's go ahead and put these back here so that they can be used here. Okay, and then we can see that this is working just fine. And again, let's just play around with our example again, just to show why we needed to make this uh, return type integer here when we add the two bools together for whatever reason here. Um, now that's the basic idea. Now, in some cases, we can run into an ambiguous match here. So if I go over to the function overloading page here, and uh, let me just go ahead and scroll to, again, function overloading here, you'll go ahead and see that, well, in the case that we have no match, then that can be reported. It can try to do the conversion, as we saw in the case where it was converting bools to integers, that was fine. It can then try matching with other qualifiers. So for instance, if I have things like const or mutable or these types of qualifiers, and then of course it finds the exact match here. And if it can't resolve one of these options, then well, we just can't get the function called. So let's go ahead and try to get ourselves in a situation where we have something ambiguous. So what I'll go ahead and do here is get rid of uh, these values here. Let's make these floats here uh, for C and D. And I usually like to prefix them uh, with F here. And what I'm gonna go ahead and do here is let's change these ints here to uh, float. And let's go ahead and change these ints to another type we have in D that we don't want to forget about. I'm going to change these bools to reals and make sure we change everything here. Okay, um, yep, one more change here. Okay, so now let's go ahead and create some real values here, x. Uh, and again, I'll set it equal to maybe uh, 3.0 and another real for y. Let's try 4.0, and let's go ahead and try to run this. And in this case, this example is okay. Because again, we are able to match up the exact types here, floats and reals, to our actual types here. But what if I, again, try to confuse the compiler here? So let's just make everything a double, which would be a floating point number with more precision. And let's go ahead and do a double. And I'm going to try to, again, remove anything that could help the compiler here. So those float signs. And let's see if the compiler can figure it out. And well, maybe I hit this a little bit fast, but it just can't figure it out. It says double matches both here. So we could have that implicit conversion that says, hey, just treat this double as a float and lose precision uh, for one of these calls. Uh, and likewise, do the same thing with the real. So that's where we can run into these ambiguous cases, and then we would need to either fix this. Now, again, the decompiler does a nice job here of warning us that there is this ambiguity that exists without just sort of uh, guessing and converting or calling one of these functions. So it's a little bit of a gotcha that you have to be careful with sometimes. But again, I just want to show you that this is a feature available in D, and feature that's often not in uh, C compilers uh, by default, where you'd have to name these different things. That's why you'll see sometimes in the C standard library, we would just rename this function, for example, add reals or add F here. And that would be how the call is uh, made less ambiguous here. So I could just do add R, add F here. And in this case, I'm giving the actual information to the compiler with a specific call, and it can do the implicit conversion. Okay, so that's the basic idea. If you haven't seen function overloading, that's one way to resolve it. But in general, we do like to have a consistent API. So if I go back in time here, <laughs> a little bit to our working examples here, we can actually use the same name, and the compiler is smart enough to use the closest match as far as the function signatures, meaning the types of the arguments and the parameters, and the return type to figure out which function to call. If you're never sure, you can always give yourself a little right here or use a debugger to see which function is actually being called.
So folks, with that said, I hope that was a useful lesson and just another feature to know about in the deep programming language about how functions work and that you can overload functions, which is often very convenient for you to do. Now, this will also be very important to keep in mind because we'll look at function templates later on in the series. So make sure you subscribe so you don't miss that later down the road when we get to that topic. And with that said, comment below if you have any questions and I'll look forward to talking to you in the next lesson.